I just want to say that it's an honor um, to be sharing the stage with so many people who are speaking so incisively about human dignity. Um, that's not really the topic of my own talk, um, but I think there's a connection in particular to some of the things that Celil uh, raised um, about uh, inequality and how we might address them. And here we go. So I'm going to speak today from the perspective of someone who's worked both in the academy as a cognitive scientist professor for a couple decades um, and also in industry uh, as the founder of a company that was just purchased by Uber. Um, and I'll say as a uh, sort of footnote, what Wendell tells me that I was the first person to write about the driverless car ethical dilemmas that we heard about uh, earlier today and that Barack Obama mentioned recently. Um, so maybe I have a little foresight and you can, you can take seriously what I have to say. I don't know. Um, my aim today is basically to provoke you. So I'm going to start with some contrarian uh, thoughts on the state of AI, although Yashua and I come remarkably close, I think, to our overall view. Um, and then I'm going to conclude with some suggestions about what might be necessary to move forward if we're going to achieve AI's true potential uh, for contributing to humanity. So first part, where is the field right now? Well, the first lesson I want to give you is that we're not nearly as close to strong artificial intelligence as many believe. I think there's been a trend throughout the day where we started with a lot of enthusiasm, and there's been a little bit of uh, skepticism filtering through, and I'll, I'll keep the trend in that direction. Um, so here, here's um, some optimism from Andrew Eng that was in the Harvard Business Review a few months ago. Um, Andrew said that if you have a task that takes less than one second of thought, a machine can probably do it either now or very soon. And I don't believe that uh, for a minute. Um, Andrew is, of course, half correct. Um, uh, there are some things that people can do in less than a second that AI is good at. So, for example, you can probably distinguish between Tiger Woods and a golf ball, and so can your uh, favorite deep learning net. So, um, AI is pretty good now at, at uh, recognizing objects, typically using convolutional networks that um, were developed uh, in part by Yasho and my colleague Jan LeCun at NYU and so forth. Um, the basic idea is you have big data in and you have statistical approximations out. It often works pretty well, but I would say caveat emptor. I used um, one of these apps that does deep learning, um, and this was in my hotel room in Hong Kong the other day, and water bottle, water bottle, and then uh, the third one on the right, um, it came up with Pen, this uh, app that does recognition. You can find a lot more examples. The literature is filled with results that seem impressive, but often if you probe more deeply, there's something not quite right in this was actually alluded to earlier in the day. So um, here's something people can do in a second. You can describe this picture and you might come up with something like a group of young people who are playing a game of Frisbee, um, which is what a Google system came up with in 2014. Um, and you might then look at the next one, whoops, and say um, a person riding a motorcycle on a dirt road and you come up with something very similar to the machine. Um, but probably if you saw this one, you would not say that it was a refrigerator filled with lots of food and drinks. Um, if you were a patient in an Oliver Sacks book, you might, the man who mistook his wife for a hat, but you would not if you were a human being. So Jan LeCun and I al always have these debates, and he says, well, these are like optical illusions. My line is they're really more like hallucinations, and hallucinations are really part of where we are right now. The second lesson is that deep learning is good at certain aspects of perception, particularly categorization, but perception is more than categorization, and cognition or intelligence, whatever you want to call it, is more than just perception. Um, to achieve its destiny, AI is going to need to go a lot further than we have already. Um, whoops, we have a little key bounce problem here. Um, so uh, a good deep learning system might be able to identify the dog at the bottom, although it might have trouble because we don't usually see dogs with ears in this orientation. And if the mo model doesn't have a model of what ears can do, it might actually get uh, flummoxed. Um, but the real point is you can tell that it's a dog that is holding up a barbell. And if you're a human being, you can then have thoughts like, wow, how did the dog get so ripped that it could do a bench press? I've never seen that before. <laughs> your deep learning system, you can't. Um, if you are my four-year-old, you can look at this and say, that's weird. How is the ele elephant standing on the tightrope holding an umbrella? If you're deep learning system, you can identify the component parts, but not what makes this unusual. Um, the way I like to think about it as a cognitive science is that there are many things that go into intelligence. There's perception, there's common sense, there's planning, there's analogy, there's language, there's reasoning, and so forth. And what we've made real progress on, we meaning Yashua, not me, um, what we've made real progress on is perception. But the rest of it, we still haven't made that much progress collectively in the field. So here's Andrew's quote, and I think it's really important for people to understand the cynical thing that I'm going to say in a second in terms of understanding what problems can we actually solve 
um, in the humanitarian domain. So Andrew says, if a typical person can do a mental task with less than one second of thought, we can probably automate it using AI. So that would mean you can take whatever you're doing in your humanitarian organization. If you can get it done fast, a machine will do it for you. Well, we wish, but it's not really that easy. So what we really do is supervise learning. Yashua made that very clear. So we have labeled examples. So if you don't have the labeled examples, then the techniques aren't going to work. And sometimes you don't. Sometimes you have a few examples. You have five or ten. The techniques aren't going to work. So if a typical person can do a mental task with less than one second of thought and we can gather an enormous amount of directly relevant supervised data, we have a fighting chance. So long as the test data aren't too terribly different from the training data, you know, maybe elephants on tight ropes are far enough away that you have a problem and the domain doesn't change too much over time. So Go is exactly the opposite of what I'm sort of excluding. So if your problem is just like Go, we can solve it. If the rules never change, you can gather as much data as you want, you can keep iterating over and over again, we're good to go with the modern techniques. But if your problem is not like Go, like it's politics in the real world, world, we may not have the tools for you yet. Um, a lot of what we want to do remains out of reach. The stuff I ha have here in green, we do pretty well. Speech recognition, especially if it's in quiet rooms with native speakers asking search queries. Um, maybe not so well if it's in loud rooms and it's, it's not uh, search queries. We can do image recognition as long as the world is pretty bounded and there aren't too many unusual things we haven't seen before. We can do natural language understanding in narrowly bounded domains. So Siri can tell you what time a movie is playing but can't answer general questions. My favorite illustration of this these days is I asked a whole bunch of search engines, how much do transistors cost, and this is alluding to the exponentials we saw before, how much do transistors cost when the Mac Plus was released? Well, Wikipedia can tell you when the Mac Plus was released, and there are a lot of charts out there that will give you transistor cost over time, but there's no search engine that will come up with those two pieces of information together, um, which we would hope for uh, in a general uh, conversational um, AI system. And of course, AI is great at advertisement targeting, but I think Joshua and I want to see AI do more than that. Um, so we would like to see conversational interfaces, automated scientific discovery for solving things like cancer, automated medical diagnosis. We're making progress there on the visual side, but less so when we have unstructured text from doctor's notes and so forth. Automated scene comprehension, we see a little progress. I'd love to see how well the Facebook stuff does. My guess is that it's not that hard to fool. Um, domestic robots for elder care is obviously something we'd like to see, but the AI is nowhere near strong enough yet. We'd like to see uh, driverless cars. Well, we have those, but safe, reliable driverless cars might be further away than people think. AI can truly improve the world, but we're going to need some fundamental advances first. Well, why aren't we there? Here's some impediments, I think, to reaching strong AI. The first is engineering machine learning is hard. It's difficult to debug it. It's difficult to revise it incrementally in the classical way. So when I learned to code, you made modules, and then you made bigger modules. You verified that the smaller modules worked, and then you put them together to make larger modules. There are ways you can sort of approximate that, but we can't really do the same thing in machine learning, and it's difficult to verify. In a talk at MTech a couple years ago, Peter Norvik, who will be here later, um, at least by uh, Skype, um, said, you know, the, the way that things work now is like your data works, you, you test the model on Tuesday, and it seems to work on Thursday, and then suddenly it's Christmas, and all the assumptions break, and the model doesn't work anymore. It's a very empirical science without guarantees right now. We have no procedures for reliably building complex cognitive systems yet. Um, there's a great paper that came out of Google, this is by John Scully's nephew, as it happens, um, called Machine Learning, the High Interest Credit Card of Technical Debt. And the idea is you can build the systems, they work in certain circumstances, but you don't have those guarantees that when you change the rest of the system downstream that it's really all going to work out. Um, XKCD really captured this the other day. This is your machine learning system, says one person. Yep, you just pour the data into this big pile of linear algebra and then collect the answers on the other side. And the other says, well, what if the answers are wrong? And well, you're just supposed to stir the pile until the answers start looking right. That's probably not a robust enough solution in the long term for AI. Um, and here from the ACM, um, in fact, is um, I recently had a piece that was on the cover with Ernie Davis about common sense reasoning. The best part of the article was the cover. Your artists are great. Um, and what, what your artists did is they um, drew a robot sitting on a tree branch. And um, the point I want to make here is statistics is not the same thing as knowledge. So the, the dominant paradigm is you get supervised data. So you'd have a lot of robots cutting a lot of tree limbs and collect your supervised data and see what happens. Well, of course, you don't want to actually do that, right? You don't want to have even a single robot cut the wrong side of the tree limb, fall down and hurt itself and possibly other people with its chainsaw. You can't solve this kind of problem with 50,000 labeled examples. The third problem is that there's a bias in the field, which is to assume that everything is learned. And I don't fully know why this bias exists, but I think it's pervasive. So here's uh, my colleague, Jan LeCun, who's also director of uh, 
uh, Facebook AI Labs kind of making th this kind of assumption. He says what he really wants to do is basically pour in a lot of video and everything will emerge from unsupervised learning. I wish him luck, I doubt it will work. Um, I often, I, I was trained in developmental psychology and I've been uh, sort of parroting and maybe improving on uh, at, at the best um, arguments by Steve Pinker and uh, Liz Spelke and so forth from whom I learned when, when I was a student. Their arguments say, look, the, the brain of a human being starts with something innate. Noam Chomsky has made these arguments, an innate language acquisition device, the notion there are objects and sets of places and things like that innately. Nobody ever believes me when I make these arguments about people, so I've started making them about baby ibexes, which we'll see in a second, um, because people don't have the same attachment, I guess, to the ibex. So here's a baby ibex, and it's climbing um, along a hill. It can't do this by having 50,000 trials, right? If it falls once, it's out of the, the gene line. So there could be learning over evolution, which is what innateness is, what, what building something uh, in is, but it's not learning trial by trial in the way that our contemporary machines are. I would take this to be an argument um, that we need more innateness if we're going to build intelligent agents. Um, of course, in the spirit of fairness, I show you um, our robots, which don't have a lot of innate structure and <laughs> don't do as well. So I, we lost the sound, but that's okay. There's a nice little piece of ragtime here, but <laughs> you get the idea even without the, the sound. Okay. Um, so uh, we, we heard a lot about exponentials this morning. I want to advise a little caution. So in some fields of AI, in narrow AI, where you have that tightly constrained problem, the rules never change and so forth, there's genuinely been exponential progress. You can plot it by looking at scores on chess over time, things like that. There aren't any data on what I would call strong AI, so I've taken the liberty of making them up. Um, and here we have Eliza um, in 1965 and Siri around now. Somehow the little line got moved around, but you get the idea. Uh, there hasn't really been progress in general artificial intelligence, general purpose artificial intelligence. If we're really going to fulfill the destiny of AI helping in humanitarian uh, organizations, we really want to get to strong AI. There's a lot we can do now. I agree with Joshua that there's a lot of fruit to be gained in the next 10 years. But there are also a lot of things where we want genuinely uh, intelligent machines, and we're not really there yet. So how can we move forward? I'm going to give you a proposal with three premises. Um, the first premise is that world-changing AI is almost certainly going to require massive interdisciplinary collaboration. You go back to my pie chart, there's many different components to intelligence. There's going to be many different components to artificial intelligence. We need people working together. We need developmental psychologists and cognitive psychologists and linguists and people working in classical AI and people working in neural networks and people working in security and program verification, all working together. It's not going to come out of one lab. Um, the human brain is too complex to be understood by one individual, and, and true AI probably is as well. Um, so we're going to need, I think, a really strong interdisciplinary um, effort. And the second thing, and this is where I was really thinking about Salil's really inspiring talk, um, in the ideal world, AI would be a public good, not something that's owned by one corporation or eight individuals or something like that. Um, but we are headed on a path where that is what's going to happen. Um, and uh, there are companies like Google that are busy patenting some very basic ideas in AI, some of which I think are actually indefensible patents. So they're ideas that actually precede Google, for example, but you know, Google has good lawyers and they got through. And that means like, if you're a startup company, you have to worry, is Google going to sue me for using this idea that's twice as old as Google? Um, and when I started my last company, people said, oh, don't worry about it. Google only uses their patents defensively. It's ne they're never going to sue you. But um, we all know that, or many of us know, that Google has started um, some, some uh, fierce intellectual property disputes recently. Um, full disclosure, I, I own some Uber stock. But um, aside from that, um, the, the world has changed, and it could change more. It could change where um, these eight people who own AI or whatever it might hypothetically be um, aggressively pursue uh, intellectual property claims. Um, and finally, it may be that no existing uh, approach to AI research can efficiently get us to next generation AI anyway. So corporate uh, AI tends to focus on what can we do with the techniques that came out last week from Yashua's lab um, or from Jorgen's lab, I don't know if, if, if he's still here. Um, and not on what might we do a few years from now. It tends to be how can we commercialize the stuff that's mostly recently been discovered. And meanwhile, academic labs tend to work too independently of one another. If the problem is as big as I think, then a bunch of small academic labs may not be enough to get where we need. So I'm going to make my proposal now. Um, and then I'll have a coda inspired by Wendell. Um, so the proposal is let's look down the street from where we stand right now to CERN. 
CERN is a global collaboration with thousands of researchers from over 20 countries working together in common cause to build technology and science that could never be constructed in individual labs, tackling problems that other industry might otherwise neglect uh, for the common good. Maybe we need to have a model like that for AI. Global collaboration, lots of people uh, doing AI for the common good. And I will just uh, close with, I guess, two more slides. Um, Wendell asked us, um, what is it that, you know, what's one articulable, detailed uh, problem that we could all work on together? And I want to give a meta answer to that, which is, I've been thinking about how to do AI for good myself, and I don't know which of the many problems that are out there I should address myself to. And what I've been wishing for, and maybe someone can help with this, is something like Charity Navigator, but not for the individual, how should I spend my $500 or $1,000 or whatever it is, but how should my AI organization best help the world? There's all kinds of things about soft power and hard power and channels of access and who can really um, move the levers that people like me who do AI research don't really know about. We need some help from other people in this room to tell us where can we most leverage the AI techniques? What are the problems where it might actually help? Where is there actually data available? So maybe there's some way um, to, to sort of meta-ize, um, to coin a terrible word, um, Wendell's question and, and build something like Charity Navigator for AI. And I'll just end with this wonderful African proverb that Esther Dyson told me about the other day. If you want to go fast, go along, go alone. If you want to go further, go together. Thank you very much.